let's talk about Danny because Danny was definitely uh Danny was definitely a murderer. I think Danny murdered anywhere from three to five people. He sat outside a public venue and gunned down three to five innocent bystanders. I don't remember exactly how many people it was, but it was it was uh, at least at least three people he killed. Those were his charges. So Danny was sent to a psychiatric hospital for a mental evaluation. And by the way, my name's Nick. I'm a mental health nurse. I make mental health nursing videos. In this video, we're going to talk about Danny. This is when Danny was in a forensic hospital. I'm going to talk about my experience with Danny, interacting with Danny, and what all that was like. So we're going to talk about Danny. Danny's obviously not his real name. I can't give out his real name. And I can't go into too many details about Danny's situation because I would be violating his privacy and potentially HIPAA laws, which I obviously don't want to do. So Danny was charged with murder. And someone, I don't know if it was his attorney or who it was, they believed he was incompetent to proceed. So they sent him to a psychiatric state hospital for a competency evaluation. And I don't actually remember what the results of his competency evaluation were. All I knew is that every few months he had a competency eval and he must have failed it because if he had passed it, they typically would send what they would do with other patients is they would just send him back to the jail from whatever facility they came from. So he was there for for a while. So he must have not been passing his competency evaluations. And now that I think about it, I don't think I ever went back and read his competency evaluations. The odd part about Danny is that initially, if you met him, he wouldn't strike you as psychotic whatsoever. In fact, you would just think he's a, a neurotypical human being, someone just that you might meet in passing and have a normal conversation with. And being the kind of nurse that I am, I really enjoy interacting with my patients. And so, so Danny caught my interest. He was very articulate. He formed sentences completely, did not hallucinate per his report. He was alert and oriented to his position, to his charges, to the allegations, to anything and everything. This guy was just very with it. Danny and I shared a similar interest, which was chess. We both like to play chess. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to play this Danny guy and I just want to see where he's at. Why is he at the state hospital for a competency? evaluation. And if he's able to play chess really well, what is going on here? Because chess involves a lot of forward thinking. You have to be able to maintain your focus while you're playing. So I was kind of curious. I'm like, I'm really interested in playing this guy in chess, especially because of his charges. So this particular state hospital I worked at, we had something called FAIR charting. So FAIR is an acronym. It stands for Focus Acquiring Information. Oh God. And then Recognizes Rights. R stands for Recognizes Rights, but I can't remember what I stands for. Okay, well, I Google it. It doesn't even come up, but it's 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 this charting that is supposed to help clinicians and forensic psychologists determine the competency of a particular patient. So when, when a forensic psychologist does their competency evaluation, they look at, at a whole host of things related to the patient, how they're acting on the unit, what their charges are. If they're able to do simple kind of mathematical tasks, they take into account a lot of information when, when looking and evaluating the competency of a patient. So this fair charting is supposed to kind of aid them in their evaluation as far as the patient's behavior goes. And it's driving me mad that I cannot remember what I stands for. Focus acquires knowledge. I stands for interact appropriately. Thank God my brain is working this morning. It's like 4.45 a.m., mind you. So do they interact appropriately and then do they recognize their rights? So fair charting. So F stands for focus. Can they maintain focus? Or when you have a conversation with them, do they just drift off and they don't even know what the topic of the conversation was. Do they acquire knowledge? Can you give them just a simple bit of information? Like, hey, you're going to see the psychologist today at 10 a.m. and do they re remember that? Interacts appropriately. Do they maintain proper eye contact when you guys are talking? Do they gesture frequently? Do they turn their bodies? Do they maintain what is normally considered to be normal amount of personal space in your interaction? And then recognizes rights could be anything from, hey, can I make a phone call. Okay, that's an implicit in that request is the fact that they have a right to make a phone call. Stuff like that, right? So anyhow, fair charting. I'm thinking, okay, I can interact with Danny. I didn't mean to go on a little tangent here on fair charting, but I could interact with Danny and then I could pro provide some fair charting that might be useful in evaluating his competency. And I'm thinking, man, chess, what better way than to play chess with this guy and really figure out where he is mentally? Because there's 
no way you could be completely psychotic and and play a good game of chess at a minimum right and if you were completely psychotic and you couldn't play a good game of chess well then probably you may not be that competent you may not be competent enough to even stand trial and that's what competency stands for i guess i should have defined that so it really if you're incompetent to proceed you are incompetent to stand for your trial you don't understand the charges you don't understand the function of courtroom personnel you have no idea maybe even why you're in the state hospital which for some of you people out there who maybe don't work in mental health or are watching this video just trust me there are people out there who are so psychotic they're so in their own world they absolutely could commit a crime in that psychosis and really have no understanding of what they've done so anyhow danny does not strike me as someone who's like that whatsoever he appears to me very competent we can have articulate conversations about politics about religion about whatever and over the course of a few weeks i'm on the float pool working on this admission unit and for whatever reason i'm on this pool for a number of of days and weeks i come to, to form a pretty good relationship with danny I and mean, he would tell me all sorts of stuff like one time i don't even know how we got on the topic of this but he was talking to me about his kids danny had kids and how he would raise them and then how he would incorporate corporal punishment for when they misbehave he said something along the lines of i would never spank my kids because spanking potentially could leave a mark that someone could see that maybe a school teacher could see or something like that what he would do is he would whip them on the bottom of a feet with like a little i don't know stick or something and i was like god this guy's really sinister of course as a nurse i'm not here to judge even though i'm having these judgments in my head i'm just thinking my god i can't believe you would even do that to somebody but you would just sort of i would just kind of keep asking open-ended questions just anything to get them to talk right and all of this information is going to be part of their fair charting so danny and i eventually play chess and i'm not a phenomenal chess player but i can beat just most people that i play because i don't play very good chess players but on average i probably for people who don't play chess i'm gonna beat most people in chess even though i don't play it a lot i mean i'm like i'm like decent okay like i i understand the game understand the basics i can think maybe a few moves ahead if i have enough time and so when i'm playing danny and danny danny was the very first psychiatric patient to ever give me a run for my money there were times when i'm like crap i might actually lose this game against danny i mean he's making what appear to be good moves and so he and i would play a number of of games each game lasting maybe be anywhere from like 10 to 15 minutes long and what's odd about Danny is he would make these what appeared to be really thoughtful moves in chess and then all of a sudden he would make a blunder which is like just a really bad move in chess it's just like if you make a blunder basically you lose a significant piece on the board or you put yourself at a significant disadvantage right and so i remember with danny he would make like i remember him losing his queen the queen is like pretty much your most important piece on the board if you lose your queen it's fair to say you can just pretty much safely resign right so i remember playing with danny we're like 10 minutes into the game it's a pretty intense game i can't really tell who's ahead we both appear to be in decent positions and then it's like all of a sudden he, you know, he's sitting there thinking for a while and I had this, I was attacking his queen and it's like, he just made a, just a very huge blunder. And then I take his queen and I'm like, okay, he clearly can maintain focus, but it seems like there's just this mental lapse. And this is what happened. I thought, you know, it's normal in chess. Sometimes you're thinking so much. You forget about the most obvious move or you forget. Oh yeah. By the way, my queen, if I don't move her, she's going to get taken. But you can just be thinking so moves ahead that you actually forget that, which is kind of normal, right? But he and I would play frequently enough to where he would you would think he would eventually pick up on that. But it's like he'd make, I don't know, 10 to 15 really good moves. And then all of a sudden just would have this blunder, this mental lapse that I don't know. I don't know how you account for that kind of blunder. So that to me was a little suspicious. It certainly wouldn't mean that he's necessarily incompetent, but that to me was, it was just weird. It's like he had these mental lapses, but I don't think like you could have a mental lapse and then just have a mental lapse and go out and kill, you know, a bunch of people, especially people you don't even know innocent bystanders then the other odd thing about danny is when i say he was he was kind of normal that's that's the way he would present for maybe the first like 10 to 20 minutes of conversation but if you really asked him open-ended questions he would eventually give you these answers where you're just like bro what are you talking about like you are completely out of touch with reality and of course as i'm making this video i can't remember really any specific comments that he made this was probably i don't know two to three years ago it's like you know the the conversation would be normal and then all of a sudden he would talk, he would have some sort of delusion about something. I just remember feeling like, whoa, 
That is a weird comment. You are on this normal train of thought. Then all of a sudden they make this weird comment. And you know, as a nurse, you're just you're just trying to be chill. You're trying to kind of keep your poker face a little bit, but just off the wall comments. And usually what I'll do when someone makes an off the wall comment, I'll ask them, what made you say that? Something like that. Like, how did you get to this this off the wall comment from what we were talking about over here? And I can't, I can't really remember what, I wish I could remember what Danny said so I could give you a better idea of some of the stuff he would say. But here's another curious thing about Danny. And you really, and it, I don't know what to make of this. I guess it's unfortunate because you see it all throughout mental health nursing is that people who come from impoverished backgrounds, who don't have adequate legal representation, who don't have support outside the hospital, et cetera, those people who are underrepresented tend to get treated worse in a psychiatric facility. Psychiatrists are more likely to just prescribe them whatever medication they want to. Staff are less likely to treat them with respect, et cetera, et cetera, right? So Danny was never given any sort of involuntary medication. But the fact of the matter is, if you talk to the guy for long enough, which I'm, sur I'm sure the psychologist did, I'm sure the psychiatrist did and all of that, you could see that he was delusional, that there was just something was not right with him. And in that respect, maybe I could see, like he would, let's see, what would I, um, how would I categorize his beliefs? And I'm a nurse, so I don't really know the proper language to categorize these kind of delusions. But it's like, let me give you kind of an example. Okay, let's just say I'm a bigoted misogynist and I do not think a woman should ever run for presidency. And this was not his belief and I don't wanna talk about his specific belief because I feel like it could be a violation of privacy and I kind of remember what statements he was making but I don't really wanna go into it. It just makes me feel a little too nervous. But this will still give you, you'll still come away with the same idea. Let's say that I'm a, a bigoted misogynist, can't stand women, I don't like them whatsoever and I think that a woman should never run for presidency. This kind of guy, this is the kind of guy who, if a female, if he had these, if he had this belief, if Danny really had this belief, and there was a female running for presidency, I could see him trying to kill her because of his belief. And he'd be so firm in that belief, and he'd have all these kind of bogus ways in which he would affirm that belief that it would be so true to him that what he did was the right thing to do. In his head, that is the right thing to do. He is acting very morally to do what he's doing by trying to attempt to assassinate this female candidate, right? Like that is kind of the delusional thought process that we're working with here. And you would see it with Danny. If you talk to him long enough, this kind of stuff would come up where it's almost like you could understand how he might have a particular belief and you might not agree with that belief, but then the next jump would be like, well, X, Y, and Z should happen because I have this belief. And you're just like, oh my God, like that is scary. I can't believe this guy was out in public before that kind of stuff. Very, very extreme kind of black and white thinking. But I think I, I think I digress. So what's interesting about Danny is that in my mind, I had met a number of other patients at the state hospital who could keep it together better than Danny could and yet who were on involuntary medications, medications that they could not refuse. And yet Danny, because he was a high profile case, was in the news a lot, because Danny had attorneys, because the eye was always watching Danny, no one would ever touch him. Psychiatrists wouldn't prescribe him any sort of medication. It's, it's, it's crazy to think that that's the world we live in, is that the underrepresented can easily be treated a certain way and the overrepresented can be treated another way with a lot more respect just because of the high profile nature of the crimes that they're charged with. Now, granted, I mean, these are charges, but it sounded like there was a preponderance of evidence, like overwhelming evidence, right? Witnesses, probably videotaping of him do that. I mean, it's unde undeniably it was him that did it. It's more like, well, was he in the competent frame of of mind to commit this crime or was he psychotic, I think is is where the legal system was kind of going with him. But one thing I one thing I really did enjoy about Danny is he wouldn't take shit from staff, especially if staff was disrespectful to him. He was with it enough to know that he never could be prescribed an involuntary medication. He was kind of untouchable. So he could give just as much flack back to disrespectful staff as staff would give to him. And it's like, you can't do anything to me. And then he would file like a bunch of grievances and stuff like that. Like, I don't think anything ever really happened from it, but it was just kind of cool to see a patient who wasn't scared to stand up for their rights because they knew that nothing could really happen. They knew they couldn't be given meds. And he would, the funny thing is with like Danny, you know, he's in the hospital, but he would refuse everything. He'd refuse any sort of legal counseling. We had these little legal groups that would talk about the constitution, rights, what courtroom personnel do, what a judge does, what a jury does. 
what charges are, et cetera, right? To sort of help patients regain their competency. And Danny would just, he would refuse everything. Like we were literally warehousing this guy. We were doing nothing for him. Minus the fact that he was probably getting a competency evaluation every like two to three months. I have no idea why he was at our facility. Like we weren't doing anything. Wasn't taking any medication, wasn't attending groups. He had the right to refuse groups. It was a, yeah, it was just pointless to really have him there. And you could even like, I had, Danny and I talked about his charges. He was well aware of what he was being charged with. And what he told me was exactly in sync with what I would read on his profile, what his charges were, or inside of his chart. I mean, so how the guy did not pass his competency evaluation was was rather curious. Then again, when you work in a forensic hospital, I mean, I, I like that is one thing that just makes no sense to me. And that's why I just think to some degree, forensic evaluation is a bunch of bullshit. I mean, I would have some patients, I'm like, this guy has to pass his competency. Out of the 20 some odd male patients that are on this unit, I would put all my money that this guy would successfully pass his competency evaluation, not this psychotic guy over there who has active visual and auditory hallucinations and who it's difficult to have a conversation with. And then you know what happened? That would be the dude who'd pass. I'm just like, and I wasn't the only one. Like I, I talked to staff about this and they'd be like, yeah, it makes no sense. We had this other guy who was one of the most coherent patients I would talk to. He did have these bizarre delusions, but he could have a complete rational conversation with you. And the dude like never passes competency eval. Maybe I'll make another video about him because my hunch is that he didn't pass the comp eval because the comp eval you ate or didn't like him. He just, the guy was like very anti-government and yeah, it's a whole like political thing by the way. So anyway, that's my very disjointed story on Danny. I didn't have a rubric when I was doing this. So Hopefully the story was somewhat followable. Followable? That's a word. Yes, I will uh, see you on the next video.